Hi everyone. Today we'll finish our look at the conflicts over slavery in the 1850s. When most Northerners said that they were opposed to the extension of slavery, it's crucial to understand that free soilers, as they were known, did not advocate for the abolition of slavery in the South. They were simply arguing that the South should not be permitted to expand slavery, to grow it beyond the states where it already existed. Free soilers were not advocates of black equality. Quite often, they were as racist as their southern opponents. When free soilers came to control the Kansas Territory, one of their earliest acts was a measure banning the settlement of blacks, free or slave. The quarrel between North and South, it cannot be stressed enough, was over the expansion of slavery, not its existence. This political cartoon of the period captures the free soil idea. If they were not opposed to the existence of slavery in the South, why should free soilers object to it in the West? Their opposition grew out of what they saw as the lessons of the separate sectional evolution of the North and South. Free soilers were Northerners who regarded their section of the country as a progressive society, blessed with abundant opportunities for its citizens. They thought the people of the North were independent and largely of the middling sort, neither rich nor poor. All supposedly had a chance to rise in this society, if not to riches, then to the prosperous life of successful farmers and businessmen. The South, on the other hand, seemed to free soilers almost a reverse of the North. Whereas the North was progressive, the South was backward and feudal. Whereas the North was middle class and egalitarian, the South had extremes of wealth and poverty and was dominated by a small elite. Whereas the North was a land of opportunity, the South was a land where slavery made it almost impossible for white labor to get its just rewards. The North elevated labor and hard work. The South degraded them. Free laborers could not compete against workers who drew no wage and whose work was coerced. Blacks might be victims of slavery, but for those who believed in what historians have come to call the free labor ideology, white laborers were also slavery's victims. The whole society suffered to enrich a few. Of course, the fear that Northerners had of Southern success belied their assertions that the section was backward and enfeebled. Southern agriculture was extraordinarily productive. The yield of raw cotton in the South had doubled every decade after 1800. No Northern commodity matched that record. About 60% of American exports originated in the South, and the foreign exchange they earned was critical to American economic growth. What Northerners took as signs of Southern backwardness, the section's lack of urban centers, its lack of industry, its high rates of illiteracy, Southerners praised as signs of Republican virtue. Farming, they contended, was the highest and most Republican of avocations, and education was unnecessary for the mass of people who tilled the soil. What was more important than the particulars of this debate was that most Americans, North or South, began to see the differences dividing the sections as more significant than the common culture and institutions that united them. When looking South, Northerners saw a threat to their own interests. They were worried about slavery's effect on white labor, not on black labor. The West became an area of critical importance to those who accepted the assumptions of the Northern free labor ideology. 
As they saw it, the driving force of the northern system was its equality of opportunity, and central to that opportunity was the ability of northerners to get cheap land and create their own farms. The expansion of slavery threatened to cut off northern access to cheap land. Northerners would be unable to compete with slaveholders who commanded the unpaid labor of blacks. Without access to the west, opportunity in the north would decline and it would begin to evolve into a class society with great extremes of wealth and poverty, just like the south. Even those northerners who never intended to go west and get a farm, thus had an interest in the outcome of the struggle for the territories. For if slavery cut off their access to western lands, then they and their children would eventually find their way of life destroyed, as our political cartoon here warned. With so much writing on the issue, congressional attempts at compromise achieved only limited success. The Compromise of 1850, which admitted California as a free state, pared down the exaggerated boundaries claimed by Texas and organized New Mexico and Utah territories with no restrictions on slavery, solved the immediate problem of administering the Mexican cession. But the deal only postponed rather than averted the crisis over slavery in the territories. The issue rose again in proposals to organize territorial governments in Kansas and Nebraska. Stephen A. Douglas pictured, again here, the Democratic senator from Illinois, was eager to organize the new territories out of lands that had been promised in perpetuity to Native American tribes, removed from the East only a few years before. He wanted to create the new territories to advance his plans for a transcontinental railroad that would begin in his home state. Senator David R. Atchison of Missouri, captured in this photograph, let Douglas know what the cost of that support would be. Atchison told Douglas that he would see Nebraska, in his words, sink in hell before voting to organize it as a free territory, as the Missouri Compromise demanded. The little giant from Illinois, who already believed settlers were fully competent to judge for themselves what kinds of laws and institutions were best adapted to their conditions and interests, attempted to cut through the slavery controversy with the sword of popular sovereignty. Let the settlers of each territory decide for themselves whether the territory was to be slave or free. At the beginning of 1854, Douglas introduced what became known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act in Congress. The bill discreetly failed to mention either slavery or the Missouri Compromise. When Southern senators, whose votes were needed to pass the bill, pointed out that his measures would, because of its silence, leave the Missouri Compromise restriction against slavery in effect, Douglas suddenly discovered that, through clerical error, an essential section of his bill had been omitted, one that gave the inhabitants of the Kansas Territory the power to deal with slavery. Southern congressmen claimed that not even this resort to popular sovereignty was enough, and Douglas further amended his proposal to declare explicitly that the Missouri Compromise was, in the language of the bill, inoperative and void. At the same time, he agreed to divide the region into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. Charged by critics with caving to pro-slavery interests, Douglas was trying to repeat, in 1854, the coup he'd pulled off in the Compromise of 1850. He was willing to add to his bill almost any amendments concerning slavery because he thought them irrelevant and inconsequential since, as he said, the laws of climate and of production 
and of physical geography have excluded slavery from that country, the wording of the legislation was, in his words, a matter of no practical importance. Douglas would, therefore, give the South the language it wanted and the North the substance. To make his compromise palatable this time, Douglas sought to sweeten the deal for all parties by sponsoring not just one, but three transcontinental railroad projects, which would give speculators, builders, and politicians in all sections of the country urgent practical reasons for backing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But the strategy that had worked so well for Douglas in 1850 backfired in 1854. Southerners came out in support of Douglas's bill, and they bullied the Democratic president, Franklin Pierce of Vermont, who we see here, into endorsing and backing the bill. Following one of the most bitter debates ever to occur in Congress, during which Douglas again demonstrated his superb gifts as a parliamentary tactician, both the House and the Senate passed the bill, and it was signed into law by President Pierce on May 30th, 1854. But this time, unlike in 1850, there was no congratulations that Douglas had saved the Union, no vast public celebrations of the new compromise. Instead, when Douglas returned to Illinois at the end of the congressional session, he found his way from Washington to Chicago, lighted by bonfires, where he was being burned in effigy. As this political cartoon of the time, showing Lady Liberty and Uncle Sam punishing the little giant made clear, this time Douglas was perceived as a villain for imperiling the existence of the Union. The North was outraged. It regarded the Kansas-Nebraska Act as a sellout to the South. By permitting Southerners to maneuver him into outright repeal of the Missouri Compromise, Douglas, as many Northerners believed, came close to tampering with the Constitution. Of course, the Missouri Compromise was not part of the written Constitution, but it was an agreement that had almost constitutional status, having been observed loyally at this point for more than three decades. The congressional maneuvering on the Kansas-Nebraska Act also, crucially, convinced many Northerners that the great national political parties, the Democrats and the Whigs, which had always served as agents of national unity and sectional conciliation, were instead being exploited to ensure minority rule rather than majority rights. Given a free choice, virtually all Northerners in Congress would have opposed the Kansas-Nebraska bill. But the Pierce administration, using every appeal, from party loyalty to political patronage, applied pressure so intense that a majority of Northern Democrats voted for it. They paid the price in the 1854 midterm elections, losing 66 of their 91 seats in the House of Representatives. To many, this unprecedented misuse of a national party to promote a sectional interest served as a signal that a general political realignment was long overdue. The Liberty and Free Soil parties had already started to draw off Northern Whigs in the 1840s. The Compromise of 1850 had weakened traditional parties in the South. Further realignment was facilitated between 1854 and 1856 by the emergence of what became known as the American, or more commonly the Know Nothing Party, whose members were supposed to respond to all outside 
inquiries about their organization, with the reply, I know nothing. It was a nativist and anti-Catholic party. This political cartoon captured their feelings clearly. Important as an expression of ethnic and religious tensions in American society, the Know Nothing movement became a convenient concealed conduit through which members of the older parties gradually and inconspicuously moved over into the camp of former opponents. In the years after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, increasing numbers of Southern Whigs slipped through the covered passage of nativism into the Democratic Party. The result was that in 1856, all but one of the slave states voted for James Buchanan, the successful Democratic candidate for president. But what the Democratic Party gained in the South, it lost in the North. 42 Northern Democrats, despite the pressure brought to bear by the Pierce administration, had voted against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Although many of them remained in the party after the vote, others began to defect to the know-nothings. As a result of these political shifts, the center of gravity in the Democratic Party shifted sharply to the South after 1854. The party that had once served as a strong bond of national unity now became an equally powerful force for divisive sectionalism. The Whig Party disappeared in the South. Meanwhile, a major new party, opposed to the Democrats, was emerging in the North. Early in the debates over the Kansas-Nebraska bill, anti-slavery leaders in Congress, including Salmon P. Chase, who we have again here, Joshua R. Giddings of Ohio, captured in this photograph, and Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, pictured here, issued a widely circulated appeal of the independent Democrats in Congress to the people of the United States, which denounced the Kansas-Nebraska Act, in their words, as a gross violation of a sacred pledge, as a criminal betrayal of precious rights, as part and parcel of an atrocious plot to exclude from a vast unoccupied region immigrants from the old world and free laborers from our own states and convert it into a dreary region of despotism inhabited by masters and slaves. Skillfully incorporating two basic free soil beliefs that free labor and slave labor could not coexist within the same territory, and that slavery blighted the economy wherever it was introduced. The appeal served as a rallying point during the protracted debates over Kansas for a protest movement throughout the North in which anti-slavery Whigs, former members of the Liberty Party, and Free Soil Democrats joined together initially given the awkward designation of the Anti-Nebraska Party. The coalition soon settled upon the name Republican in the summer of 1854. The 1856 presidential election revealed decisively the shift in northern voting patterns. Although James Buchanan who we have here, the Democrat from Pennsylvania, was elected. He carried only five northern states and received fewer votes 
than the combined totals of the Know Nothing candidate, former President Miller Fillmore, seen again here, and the Republican candidate, the former explorer and adventurer, John C. Fremont, captured in this image. The new Republican Party was even more strongly sectional than the Democrats, which still maintained a prominent presence in the North, unlike the Whigs, which now no longer existed at all in either section of the country. The Republican Party had virtually no strength in any slave state. Thus in the North, as in the South, the party system, once a strong unifying force for the country, became in the mid-1850s a literal threat to the nation's existence. Equally ominous was the weakening of Americans' faith in the Constitution that resulted from the fight over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. From the beginning of the Republic, the law had operated on the assumption that the federal government controlled the territories that it would dictate the organization of government, and that self-rule would come gradually. The Kansas-Nebraska Act made self-rule immediate, relegating a question of critical national interest, the expansion of slavery, to a few thousand voters in a western territory, upsetting the political balance between the North and the South. Since everyone seemed to agree that slavery had to expand or die, and because Kansas was the only national territory of the moment into which it could conceivably expand, both pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces girded up for Armageddon there. Under the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the voters in Kansas were to decide whether the territory would be slave or free. About 4,200 settlers came to Kansas from New England. The New Englanders settled largely around Lawrence and Topeka. Most free soil settlers came from neighboring states of the Midwest, and although they were opposed to slavery in Kansas, they were not abolitionists. Southerners who regarded Kansas as naturally destined for slavery because of its proximity to the slave state of Missouri, were outraged by Northern efforts to control the territory. A free Kansas on the border of Missouri would, they argued, create too great a temptation for slaves to escape. They were ready to do what was necessary to make Kansas a slave state. The contest for Kansas began in earnest in November 1854, when Senator David R. Atchison himself led a large group of border ruffians, as they came to be known, across the Missouri line to vote illegally in the Kansas elections for a delegate to Congress. Here in this sketch we see the border ruffians marching into Kansas. Out of 6,318 votes cast in the legislative elections of 1855, a congressional investigation found 4,908 were fraudulent. Despite the criminality, the illegally elected legislature remained seated, and legitimate free soil settlers from the North who by 1855 outnumbered legitimate pro-slavery settlers, refused to accept its authority. They set up their own government at Topeka to oppose the pro-slavery government at Lecompton. Both sides in the struggle quickly armed to the teeth. In 1856, pro-slavery judge Samuel Lecompte, pictured here, instructed a grand jury to indict free state government officials for treason 
and authorized the deputation of Missourians to arrest them. Many of these officials lived in Lawrence, the heart of free soil strength in Kansas. When they invaded the town, the Missourians not only arrested the leaders, but also demolished two newspaper offices, plundered houses and shops, and burned the hotel and the free state governor's house to the ground. This sketch depicts what became known as the Sack of Lawrence. In the United States Senate, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts arose to denounce the actions as the work of, in his words, murderous robbers from Missouri, hirelings picked from the drunken spew and vomit of an uneasy civilization. Two days later, Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina assaulted Sumner on the floor of the Senate, beating him over the skull with a gold-headed cane over 30 times, an event captured in this illustration of the time. He left the Massachusetts senator collapsed at his desk in a rapidly spreading pool of blood. Sumner survived the attack, but his recovery took three years. When he returned to the Senate, he was as passionate in his anti-slavery agitation as ever. Kansas became a rehearsal for the Civil War. After the sack of Lawrence and the beating of Sumner, Kansas descended into a near constant state of violence. Like some Old Testament patriarch, the free soiler and radical abolitionist John Brown gathered his sons about him and set out to take revenge for the sack of Lawrence, telling his followers that we must fight fire with fire. Brown selected five pro-slavery settlers living along the Potawatomi Creek and murdered them, even mangling some of the bodies. The combination of the Sack of Lawrence and the Potawatomi Massacre, as it came to be known, threw Kansas into a prolonged period of chaos. Here we see a picture of John Brown from the time. Federal troops in Kansas prevented full-scale battles between anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces, but they could not stop guerrilla warfare. House and crop burnings, livestock thefts, tarring and feathering, torture, murder, and mutilation of the corpses of the slain all became commonplace. Within just a few months, over 200 settlers had lost their lives, and the combatants had destroyed around $2 million worth of property across the territory. Kansas became bleeding Kansas, and a major issue for the new Republican Party. The situation worsened still more in 1857 when the illegally elected pro-slavery legislature arranged for a rigged constitutional convention that passed what became known as the Lecompton Constitution. The document not only instituted slavery in Kansas, but also made it permanent. Later voters could not make it illegal. The convention phrased a referendum on the Constitution in such a way that a vote for or a vote against approved slavery. Free soilers refused to vote, and the pro-slavery settlers submitted the Constitution to Congress as the basis for statehood. President James Buchanan accepted it, but Stephen A. Douglas in the Senate fearing that his beloved popular sovereignty in Kansas had been turned into a travesty, 
led opposition against his own party and his own president in Congress to help defeat the admission of Kansas as a slave state. The result was that in 1858, the violence and bloodshed in Kansas continued. Not until after the secession of the slave states in 1861 would Kansas finally enter the Union as a free state. The most infamous case in the history of the United States Supreme Court began simply enough. Dred Scott, who we see here, wanted to be free. Unlike most slaves, however, Scott had what he believed was a legal claim to his freedom. For many years, Scott had been the slave of Dr. John Emerson, an army surgeon who had taken him to live on military bases in the Free State of Illinois and later to Fort Snelling in what is today St. Paul, Minnesota. At that time, present-day Minnesota was part of the Wisconsin Territory. In 1846, Scott filed suit in a Missouri court to gain freedom for himself, for his wife, Harriet, and for their two children. Scott argued that living in those free jurisdictions had made him and his family free, and once free, they remained free, even after returning to the slave state of Missouri. In 1847, when the case went to trial, Scott lost on technical grounds. In 1848, the Missouri Supreme Court granted Scott the right to a new trial, and in January 1850, Scott and his family won their freedom in a St. Louis court. A jury of 12 white men in Missouri concluded that Scott's residence in a free state and a free territory had, in fact, made him free. However, in 1852, the Missouri Supreme Court reversed this result. In 1854, Scott turned to the federal courts and renewed his quest for freedom in the United States Circuit Court in Missouri. There, a judge upheld Scott's right to sue in a federal court, but after a trial, rejected his claim to freedom. Scott remained a slave. Scott then appealed to the United States Supreme Court. In 1857, the court, in a 7-2 decision, held that Scott was still a slave. In his opinion of the court, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, who we have here, declared first that no black person could ever be a citizen of the United States, and therefore could not sue in federal courts, and second, that Congress did not have the power to prohibit slavery in the federal territories, meaning the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was unconstitutional, as were all other restrictions on slavery in the territories. These two dramatic and controversial rulings placed the decision at the center of American politics and law. It was within the context of the opening of vast western territories to slavery, the violence of bleeding Kansas, and the creation of a new political party dedicated to stopping the spread of slavery into the west, that the Supreme Court heard the Dred Scott case in 1856. And these events undoubtedly affected the decision handed down in the spring of 1857. Dred Scott appealed to the Supreme Court in December 1854, alleging that the Federal Circuit judge had made an error in charging the jury that Scott was not entitled to his freedom. The appeal reached Washington too late for the 1854 term, so the Supreme Court held the case over 
for the December 1855 term, and finally heard arguments in February 1856. The briefs and the oral arguments, which took four days to present, focused on whether blacks could be citizens of the United States, on the power of Congress to prohibit slavery in the territories, and on the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise. In May, the court postponed a decision until the following year and scheduled re-argument on two crucial questions. One, whether the plea in abatement, effectively a motion to dismiss the case, was legitimately before the Supreme Court, and two, whether a free Negro could be a citizen of a state or of the United States, and as such, bring a suit in federal court. In December of 1856, the court heard new arguments on these two issues and on the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise. By now, the case was attracting increased public attention. What had begun in 1846 as an attempt by Dred Scott to gain freedom for himself and his family had become a case with potentially monumental legal and political significance. For at least a decade, the nation had faced constant political turmoil over the status of slavery in the territories. Northern resistance to the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 further heightened sectional tensions. The five Southerners on the court wanted a decision that would settle in favor of the South the issues of slavery in the territories and the rights of free blacks. If the court held the Missouri Compromise to be unconstitutional, then all the territories would be open to slavery. If the court declared that blacks could never be citizens of the United States, then alleged fugitive slaves and their white friends might be less able to resist the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. By the 1850s, the Chief Justice, Roger B. Taney, was a seething, angry, uncompromising supporter of the South and slavery, and an implacable foe of racial equality, the Republican Party, and the anti-slavery movement. The Supreme Court in the 1850s was a Democratic Party stronghold at a time when the party was dominated by its southern pro-slavery wing. All but one of the justices had been appointed by a Democrat. Along with the five pro-slavery southerners on the court were two doe-face justices, northerners with southern sympathies who could be relied upon to support slavery. The Chief Justice, in his opinion, argued that at the founding of the nation, blacks were either all slaves or, if free, without any political or legal rights. Blacks were so far inferior, he insisted, that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. He concluded that blacks could never be citizens of the United States, even if they were born in the country and considered to be citizens of the states in which they lived. Having reached this conclusion, however, Taney could not then legally consider the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise. If Dred Scott had no right to sue in federal court, then the Supreme Court should have dismissed the case for lack of jurisdiction. But this did not stop Taney and the pro-slavery justices, who went on to declare the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. Taney's goals were more political than legal. He could easily have upheld Dred Scott's slave status without commenting on the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise or the rights of free blacks. But Taney hoped to resolve the festering problem of slavery in the territories so that it would no longer be a central issue in American politics. By declaring that Congress had no power 
to ban slavery from the territories, Taney was in effect trying to preempt all political debate and discussion of the subject. Many people in the country, including the new president, James Buchanan, wanted the Supreme Court to settle the issue of slavery in the territories once and for all. In his inaugural address, delivered just two days before Taney announced the court's ruling, Buchanan said that the issue of slavery in the territories was, in his words, a judicial question, which legitimately belongs to the Supreme Court of the United States. He pledged to cheerfully submit to the court's decision and said he believed all good citizens would do the same. His prediction proved ill-founded. Instead, the perceived illegitimacy of the Dred Scott decision became the focus of intensely divisive political debate throughout the country. The, res the ruling on the Missouri Compromise gave the new Republican Party all the ammunition it needed against Democrats in the upcoming 1858 midterm elections, and beyond that, the presidential election of 1860. Dred Scott's personal story had a better ending, as shortly after the court's ruling, white sympathizers purchased he and his family's freedom, even as the country itself moved closer towards civil war. Radical abolitionists in the North, who had pioneered an alternative reading of the Constitution based on a uniform national citizenship not limited by race, responded bitterly to the Dred Scott decision. They insisted that all free persons born in the United States, whether black or white, had to be considered citizens. Many politicians in the new Republican Party agreed with this position. Republicans especially objected to Chief Justice Roger B. Taney's reversal of the Freedom National Doctrine. They accused the Supreme Court of making slavery the norm and freedom the exception, transforming the South's peculiar institution into a national one that must exist everywhere it had not been prohibited by state law. The decision they claimed even threw into question whether states possessed the constitutional authority to prohibit slavery. The Dred Scott decision propelled to the forefront of public debate questions that would dominate politics until the outbreak of the Civil War. The founders' intentions regarding slavery, whether slavery should be viewed as a local or national institution, and the constitutional authority of the federal government to prohibit slavery in the territories. The highlight of the Illinois Republican Party State Convention in 1858 was Abraham Lincoln's speech launching his campaign for the Senate against the little giant, Stephen A. Douglas. Here we have a picture of what Lincoln looked like in the 1850s. He set out to demolish the idea that any Republican could, in good conscience, support Douglas for re-election. He linked his opponent to the designs of the slave South and denied that any middle ground existed between the friends and foes of slavery. Lincoln addressed the consequences of Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. He noted that since the policy of popular sovereignty had been put in place, with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation, the problem had not only not ceased, but had constantly augmented. Lincoln said that, in his opinion, the problem would never go away 
until, as he put it, a crisis shall have been reached and passed. As he famously explained in his words, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it's in the course of ultimate extinction, or of its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Lincoln spelled out what he called a tendency toward the nationalization of slavery. He accused Douglas of participating in a broad conspiracy involving Presidents Pierce and Buchanan and Chief Justice Taney to make slavery legal throughout the United States. Lincoln's point in the House Divided speech was not the imminence of civil war, but that Illinois voters and all Americans must choose between supporting or opposing slavery. Lincoln identified not Congress or the courts, but public sentiment as the key battleground where the fate of slavery would be decided. The entire conspiracy rested on Douglas's effort to mold public opinion to accept the moral equivalence of freedom and slavery. Once that had been accomplished, Northerners would join Douglas in not caring whether slavery is voted down or voted up. Here was the reason no Republican should consider supporting Douglas for re-election. As Lincoln put it, our cause must be entrusted to and conducted by those who do care for the result. For his part, Stephen A. Douglas condemned the House Divided speech as a call for civil war by a man who had revealed himself to be a radical abolitionist. Douglas did not mince words in appealing to racism. As he stated, this government of ours is founded on the white basis for the benefit of the white man to be administered by white men. He accused Lincoln of opposing the Dred Scott decision because he favored racial equality. Lincoln's talk of national uniformity, moreover, revealed a misunderstanding of the essential principle of self-government, the right of every community to judge and decide for itself whether a thing is right or wrong. Douglas challenged Lincoln's effort to appropriate the founders to the anti-slavery cause. Popular sovereignty, he insisted, descended from Jefferson's vision of a decentralized empire of liberty. Why, Douglas asked, could the nation not continue to exist half slave and half free, as it had for over half a century? The day after Douglas made these statements, Lincoln responded in a speech at Chicago. After calling slavery a vast moral evil, he said that the future of slavery could not be equated with the cranberry laws of Indiana, the oyster laws of Virginia, or the liquor laws of Maine. On such issues, each locality could and should determine policy for itself. But slavery was a national question, what Lincoln called a wrong to the whole nation that demanded a national solution. Soon after this Chicago speech, Lincoln challenged Douglas to meet him in a series of debates. They quickly agreed on seven encounters to take place between late August 
in mid-October of 1858 in towns scattered across Illinois. The great debates attracted immense national attention as they were taking place and became part of the lore of American politics. Here we have an illustration of one of them. Newspapers from throughout the country sent reporters to cover the encounters and transcripts quickly appeared in the press. Thousands of listeners attended each event. The first Lincoln-Douglas debate took place on August 21st at Ottawa, a town in northern Illinois, whose population of around 9,000 more than doubled on the day of the encounter. As the opening speaker, Douglas, pictured here along with Lincoln, immediately seized the initiative with a scattershot series of charges against his opponent. Lincoln had sided with the country's enemies during the Mexican War. He was responsible for radical resolutions adopted by a local Republican convention in 1854 that included calls for the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Act and abolition in the District of Columbia. He intended to, in Douglas's words, set the black and white people to marrying. Thrown on the defensive, Lincoln seemed to have difficulty responding. In a letter on the eve of the second debate at Freeport, Illinois, conveying the recommendations of Republican strategists, the Chicago editor Joseph Medill urged Lincoln to dispose of Democratic claims that Republicans favored black equality. Lincoln had started to receive letters from supporters in central and southern Illinois about the political impact of these charges and urging him to make clear in no uncertain terms that, as one message stated, Republicans are not in favor of making the blacks socially and politically equal with the whites. As the debates proceeded, Douglas relied more and more on race baiting. At the fourth debate in Charleston, Lincoln tried to neutralize Douglas's assaults with an explicit statement on the question of racial equality. It was easily the low point of his entire political career. He said that he was not at present, nor had he ever been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. He said that he was not, nor had he ever been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. Lincoln added that he believed there's a physical difference between the white and black races, which will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. So long as the two races remained together, one had to occupy a superior and the other an inferior position in society. And Lincoln said that he, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. For the rest of the campaign, Lincoln continued to deny that he favored black citizenship. Abolitionists found Lincoln's comments appalling, but conservative Republicans were delighted with Lincoln's performance. Having answered the charge of Negro equality, Lincoln in the final three debates pushed to the forefront the subject he felt most fully exemplified, his differences with Douglas, the morality of slavery. At Galesburg, Illinois, he declared that the real difference between himself and Douglas was that every sentiment he utters 
discards the idea that there's anything wrong in slavery. He said much the same thing six days later at the Quincy debate. The seventh and final encounter took place at Alton. Lincoln tried to appeal to the broadest spectrum of the anti-slavery electorate. To adopt Douglas's policies, he said, would make it impossible for free white people, including newly arrived immigrants from Europe, mostly Irish and Germans, to find new homes and better their conditions in life by moving to the West. This was the racialized version of anti-slavery that predominated in the North in the 1850s, which viewed slavery primarily as a threat to the future prospects of white Americans. But at the same time, Lincoln repeated that the natural rights of the Declaration of Independence applied to blacks. He accused Democrats like Douglas of attempting to dehumanize the Negro, to take away from him the right of ever striving to be a man, to make property, and nothing but property of the Negro in all the states of this union. On election day, the Democrats carried 17 of the formerly Whig legislative districts in central Illinois, compared to only eight for Lincoln and the Republicans. There were a number of reasons why the Republicans failed in 1858 to gain control of the Illinois legislature, ensuring Douglas's re-election. Many Eastern Republicans gave Lincoln only lukewarm support. Also, Douglas's strong opposition to the admission of Kansas under the Lecompton Constitution blunted Lincoln's efforts to portray him as a supporter of slavery. Nonetheless, had the senator been chosen by popular vote, it seems likely that Lincoln would have emerged victorious. Taken together, the Republican legislative candidates significantly outpolled their opponents. But because the apportionment of seats failed to reflect the rapid increase in population in the northern counties, since 1850, Democrats retained control of both houses of the legislature, and Douglas secured his re-election. As the editor of the Illinois Press and Tribune wrote at the time, because of the state's antique apportionment laws, Douglas had won. But the results also indicated that Illinois was becoming more and more a Republican state. Outside Illinois, 1858 ushered in a historic electoral realignment. Republicans swept to power, not only in their strongholds in the Upper North, but in the key swing states of New York, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. With the Lecompton battle having discredited the Buchanan administration in the North and Douglas in the South, Prospects for a Republican victory in 1860 seemed bright. As for Lincoln, 1858 made him a national figure for the first time. Despite his refusal to embrace equal rights for blacks, many radicals and abolitionists praised Lincoln for the forthrightness of his moral critique of slavery and his insistence that slavery must eventually come to an end. Lincoln himself seems to have assumed that the defeat marked the end of his aspiration for higher office. But other Republican Party leaders already had a different idea. As one of them wrote in the wake of the 1858 Senate race, it was unfortunate that Lincoln had lost. But looking ahead, he noted, now I'm for Lincoln for the nomination for president in 1860. Since his exploits during 1856, 
as a free state guerrilla chieftain in, Gan in Kansas. John Brown, who we see again here, now with his famous beard, had been evolving an awesome plan for a strike against slavery in the South itself. Brown was a Calvinist who believed in a God of wrath and justice. His favorite biblical passage was, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He was certain that the sin of slavery must be atoned in blood. With the single-mindedness of religious fanaticism, he was also certain that he was God's instrument to carry out the task. He planned to lead a raiding party into the Virginia mountains. There he would attract slaves from lowland plantations to his banner. He would arm them, establish a provisional freedmen's republic that could defend the mountain passes against counterattack, and move southward along the Appalachians, inspiring slave insurrections until the whole accursed system of bondage collapsed. It was a wild scheme, but Brown managed to persuade several leading abolitionists of its practicality. From 1856 to 1859, he shuttled back and forth between Kansas, the Northeast, and settlements of former slaves in Canada, recruiting volunteers raising money, and writing the Constitution for his proposed Black Republic. Garrett Smith, who we have here, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, captured in this image, Theodore Parker, seen again here, and three other Massachusetts abolitionists constituted a so-called Secret Six who helped Brown raise money in New England. Ostensibly intended for Kansas, these funds were used instead to buy arms and supplies for Brown's invasion of the South. The abolitionists who supported Brown had become convinced that moral and political actions against slavery had failed. With the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the election of Buchanan, and the Dred Scott decision, slavery had gone on from one victory to another. A violent counterstroke was the only answer they believed. The Secret Six knew and approved of Brown's general purpose, though they did not know the time and place he would strike. Brown planned to capture the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and with the weapons seized there, to arm the thousands of slaves he expected to join him. In the summer of 1859, he rented a farm in Maryland uh, across the river from Harper's Ferry and began gathering his 17 white and five black recruits. Situated at the confluence of the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers and surrounded by commanding heights, Harper's Ferry was a military trap. Brown's tactical plans were incredibly amateurish. He failed to inform any of the relatively few slaves in the area of his intentions. He neglected to reconnoiter the terrain around Harper's Ferry to work out an escape route. And he did nothing about laying in supplies or establishing a defensive line against an inevitable counterattack. When he took 18 men to seize the arsenal on the night of October 16, 1859, they carried no rations. 
The little band captured the undefended arsenal, armory, and rifle works. But having gained his initial objectives, Brown seemed not to know what to do next. He sat down to await slave reinforcements, but the only blacks who joined him were a handful of bewildered slaves gathered up along with white hostages by patrols Brown had sent out for the purpose. Meanwhile, news of the affair spread quickly. Local citizens and nearby companies mobilized on October 17. They captured the bridges across the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers, cutting off Brown's escape, and drove the raiders out of the armory, the arsenal, and the rifle works, a scene depicted in this illustration from the time. Three local men, including a free black, and several of Brown's men, including two of his sons, were killed or mortally wounded in the fighting. Seven raiders escaped. Two were later captured, and the rest were driven into the stout fire engine house, where Brown and the remaining four unwounded invaders made their last stand. During the night of October 17 into 18, a detachment of U.S. Marines, commanded by Colonel Robert E. Lee and Lieutenant Jeb Stewart, surrounded the engine house. The next morning, Brown having refused to surrender, the Marines stormed and carried the building with the loss of one man. They killed two more raiders and wounded Brown. Thirty-six hours after it began, John Brown's war to liberate the slaves was over. Seventeen men had been killed, including ten raiders. Brown and his six captured Confederates would eventually be hanged. Not a single slave had voluntarily joined the insurrection. Brown had left behind in the Maryland farmhouse a suitcase full of correspondence with the Secret Six and other northern sympathizers. When this was captured and publicized, the Secret Six, except Higginson, who defiantly stood his ground, went into hiding or fled to Canada. Some of them later testified before a congressional committee, but none was indicted as an accessory. In one sense, the Harper's Ferry Raid was a tragic, wretched failure. But in a larger sense, if Brown's goal was to provoke a violent confrontation and liberate the slaves, he succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. There's some evidence that Brown realized this, that he anticipated a martyrdom that would translate him from madman to saint in the eyes of many Northerners, while it provoked fear and rage in the South that would hasten the final showdown. During his swift trial by the state of Virginia for murder, treason, and insurrection, pictured in this sketch, Brown discouraged all schemes to cheat the hangman's rope by forcible rescue or pleas of insanity. As he told his family and friends at the time, I'm worth inconceivably more to hang than for any other purpose. During the month between Brown's sentencing on November 2nd and his execution on December 2nd, his demeanor won the admiration of millions in the North. He faced his death with dignity. This illustration captured the moment. As he walked calmly to the gallows, Brown handed one of his jailers a note. It read, 
I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. Brown's post-trial behavior elevated him to a sort of sainthood in northern anti-slavery circles. Although prominent Republicans scrambled to dissociate themselves from Brown, some of them endorsed the nobility of his aims, even while condemning his means. On the day Brown was hanged, church bells tolled in many northern towns. Cannons fired salutes. Prayer meetings adopted memorial resolutions. This outpouring of grief was an amazing phenomenon, a symbol of how deeply the anti-slavery purpose had penetrated the Northern consciousness. These manifestations of Northern sympathy for Brown sent a shock wave through the South, more powerful than the raid itself had done. No matter that Northern Republicans disavowed Brown's act, no matter that Northern conservatives and Democrats got up their own meetings to denounce Brown and all who sympathized with him, Southerners could see only the expressions of grief for Brown's martyrdom. They identified Brown with the abolitionists, the abolitionists with Republicans, and Republicans with the whole North. Panic seized many parts of the South. Slave patrols doubled their surveillance. Voluntary military companies cleaned their weapons and stood by for action. Secessionist sentiment mushroomed across the South after Brown's raid. The South Carolina Charleston Mercury, a secessionist newspaper, exulted that the day of compromise had finally passed. Harper's Ferry had, the paper noted with satisfaction, convinced even the most bigoted Unionist that there's no peace for the South in the Union. The famous author, Herman Melville, said John Brown, as pictured in this graphic illustration, was the meteor that brought about the Civil War. All right. So that does it for today. Next time we'll look at the election of 1860, what people of the time called secessionitis, and the very beginnings of the Civil War.